mengumumkan ketibaan yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Rohana Yusof, Timbalan Naib Chancellor, Hal Ehwal Pelajar, Universiti Melaya selaku pengerusi majlis pada petang ini dan Profesor Dr. Tong Miao Kiong. Hadirin dipersilakan duduk. Uh, maaf. Universiti Malaya, kebanggaan kita semua. Bertambah para ilmuwan di berbagai lapangan. Kami berdekat di hati. Hadirin dipersilakan duduk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Yang berbahagia, Datuk Dr. Rohana Yusof, Timbalan Naib Chancellor Hal Ehwal Pelajar Universiti Melaya, yang diraihkan Profesor Dr. Tong Miao Kiong, Datuk Datuk Daten-daten, barisan pengurusan Fakulti Perubatan Universiti Melaya dan hadirin sekalian. Selamat datang ke syarahan perdana oleh Profesor Dr. Tong Miao Kiong yang bertajuk Genes Medicine and Society from Pediatrics to Genetic Counseling and Beyond. Untuk tidak melengahkan majlis, dengan segala hormatnya, dipersilakan yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Rohana Yusof untuk mempengurusikan syarahan perdana ini dan seterusnya memperkenalkan Profesor Dr. Tong Miao Kiong dengan hormatnya dipersilakan.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, selamat tengah hari dan Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, yang berbahagia Prof. Datin Profesor Hamimah, Timbalan Dekan Fakulti Perubatan, yang diraihkan Profesor Dr. Tong Miao Kiong ya, dan uh, tuan-tuan, puan-puan dan saudara-saudari pelajar yang saya hormati sekalian ya. Saya tak nampak pelajar kat sini ada. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, let me just uh, give a brief introduction of uh, Professor Tong. Actually, there's uh, a lot to say about Dr. Uh, Professor Tong, but I think I'll give you a brief introduction of the man of the day today, yeah? uh, Professor Tong. Professor Tong was born in Kuala Lumpur in 1963, and his family moved from a new village to Petaling Jaya, where he attended primary education at Sekolah Rendah Jalan Sepuluh and secondary school at La Salle, Petaling Jaya. He studied medicine and later trained in pediatric at the University of Malaya. He received training in genetic at the Singapore Genetic General Hospital and established the first dedicated clinical gen gen genetics service with genetic counseling in 1995 in Malaysia, located at Genetics Clinic University Hospital Kuala Lumpur. He obtained advanced training in clinical genetics in Australia, first as a fellow in clinical genetics at the Women's and Children's Hospital Adelaide for two years, and as a senior fellow at the renowned Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia. He returned to Malaysia in 2000 as the first certified clinical geneticist in Malaysia, having obtained the fellowship of, <coughs> of the Human Genetics Society of Australasia, as well as Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of Malaya for work done in the field of molecular genetics. He established and headed the Genetic and Met Metabolism Unit at the University of Malaya Medical Center that served as a tertiary referral center for inherited disorders. On the basis of many groundbreaking findings, his work was recognized at the international level. In 2003, Professor Tong was awarded the 8th Royal College of Physicians of London and Academy of Medicine of Malaysia Annual Research Award. He was a Fulbright Scholar at the prestigious Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Atlanta, USA, between 2003 and 2004. The World Health Org Organization and March of Dimes invited him for consultation on birth defects, and subsequently he co-authored the monograph Management of Birth Defect and Hemoglobin Disorders, published in 2006. In 2007, the Australia Malaysia Institute awarded him the Australia Malaysia Fellowship in Research Excellence. In 2008, he was awarded the Fellowship of Academy of Medicine of Malaysia and the Fellowship of Travel Award by the Asia Society for Pediatric Research at the American Pediatric Academic Society's joint meeting. He was also appointed member of the Medical and Science Advisory Board AADC Trust United Kingdom in 2008 and invited to deliver lectures in the international conference in Australia, Hong Kong, Japan, India and China. Indeed, all international. Yeah. And uh, at the national level, Professor Tong has been involved in developing the subspecialty of clinical genetic in Malaysia and was instrumental in obtaining governmental recognition of clinical genetic at the Clinical Specialty in National Specialist Register. Professor Tong won numerous awards as well as gold and silver prizes in invention and biotechnology exhibitions such as Biotechnology Asia 2006 and iTech 2007 for developing software program in collaboration with members of the Faculty of Computer Science and Software Engineering UM. Professor Tong is indeed uh, all-rounder in this. <laughs> and he was instrumental in setting up genetic support groups such as Malaysian Rare Disorders Disease. In 2010, he wrote the book Rare Journeys of Love, a collection of 10 interviews with families and description of the respective genetic condition in col collaboration with MRDS. He was founding member and the current vice president of Medical Genetic Society of Malaysia. He is a current honorary treasurer of College of Pediatric Academy of Medicine, of Malaysia. His academic interests at present include neurogenetic, familiar cancer, Asian dysmorphology, and developing plans for genetic counseling program and empowering support group in Malaysia. Professor Tong is currently the head of department in pediatric faculty of medicine in Malaysia since 2009. I think uh, I'm really looking forward to hear from uh, Professor Tong. I mean, it's such a beautiful biography to read and we're waiting to listen from him. And uh, Professor Tong, the floor is yours.
Selamat petang. Salam sejahtera. Yang berbahagia, Profesor Datuk Dr. Rohana Yusof, Timbalan Naib Chancellor University Malaya. Profesor Datin Dr. Hamimah Hassan, Dean Fakulti Perubatan, Pemangku Dekan Fakulti Perubatan, Datuk Datuk Datin Datin, Profesor-Profesor, Barisan Pengurusan Tertinggi Fakulti Perubatan dan Universiti Malaya, Tuan-Tuan dan Puan-Puan, dan para hadirin sekalian. Saya berasa amat gembira dan bangga kerana mendapat peluang memberi syarahan perdana pada petang ni yang bertajuk Genes, Medicine and Society from Pediatrics to Genetic Counseling and Beyond. Izinkan saya meneruskan syarahan saya ni dalam bahasa Inggeris. Good afternoon. The story about genetics started hundreds of years ago, but it is only in the last 50 years or so that it has taken a big role in the healthcare of our patient. For today's lecture, I will co cover five main areas, and that started with the end of a new genetics, as we ought to start a, a story with the end, but it is the end of new genetics and the beginning of personal genomics, ranging to the topic of personalized medicine, Illustration from pediatrics leading to healthcare reforms in other forms of fields of medicine with the trust in genetic counseling. Lessons learned and healthcare implications from medical genetics research in Malaysia. This will be a selected uh, personal journey. So I would highlight some of this work done in University of Malaya. And what are some of the pitfalls, challenges, and opportunities uh, for healthcare in Malaysia, particularly in terms of medical genetics? Let's take a step backwards, forwards, backwards, uh, to look at population statistics before we move on to talk about genetics. Malaysia is a young country. It's been classified as a middle-income country with a population of 28 million. Our infant mortality rate over the last 50 years has plummeted from 75.7 per thousand uh, on the year that we gained independence. And 50 years later, it is now 5.1. It is probably a bit lower than just now per thousand live births. Concurrently, we have also achieved momentously in the field of maternal mortality rate and also we have improved our life expectancy uh, from 58 years to 76.4 years for a female and 55 to 71 years of age for a male citizen. So this huge uh, improvements in services, healthcare services obviously had contributed to these uh, statistics. But the picture is not so pretty if you look at it in greater detail. For example, improvements in social economic status and medical care had led to a reduction in treatable diseases, namely infections and malnutrition. But there's an apparent increase in birth defects, or what we call congenital anomalies. In 1990, more than 20% of infant deaths in Malaysia were classified as deaths due to congenital malformation or birth defects. If you look at this simple uh, bar diagram here from 70 to 1990 and probably you can extrapolate this figure there has been an apparent increase in the percentage of deaths due to birth defects this does not mean there's an increase in numbers of babies born with birth defects it simply meant that while the cause of deaths uh, have dropped for all the other uh, reasons birth defects genetic diseases had remained the same and this has made a big difference in terms of our statistics and how we should target in the future to come steps, curative steps and preventive steps to improve this sad state of affairs. This is another statistics that I have gained from the Ministry of Health who commissioned a study on study on under five deaths in Malaysia in the year 2006, five years ago. The numbers were just shocking. Many people would have thought the cause of death would be due to infection, respiratory disease, accidents and so on, but no. The highest cause of death in under five, children, under five years of age are due to congenital causes, namely birth defects and genetic diseases. So with that introduction, I will now take you to the next step on a journey on what I meant by the end of new genetics and the beginning of personal genomics. Now classically, genetics has always centered upon the fact that Mendelian 
genetics. That, that's the, the word that was propounded following discoveries by Gregor Mendel and his experiments on peas, where he uh, elucidated the mode of inheritance and he also con concluded the recurrence risk uh, for this kind of uh, uh, inbreeding, for example. Now, following that, Many new discoveries came from chromosome and study on chromosome abnormalities, namely Down syndrome. And also the concept of one enzyme, one gene, has been propounded by Garrett, followed by Tatum and O'Neill, uh, in their study following years, uh, 50 years later. But the real work actually started in 1953, when James Watson and Francis Crick, uh, who won the subsequent won the Nobel Prize, for their study on the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, really led the way to opening the doors to laboratory diagnoses, as well as counselling on issues related to persons or families with genetic disorders. And this is a picture of this uh, two Nobel Prize winner. For those who are not familiar, let me just uh, take a quick step towards uh, a, a brief overview on genes and, and chromosomes. This is a cell, the smallest unit of life, and within a cell, we have a center called the nucleus, and we have 46 uh, uh, chromosomes, or 23 pairs. These chromosomes are basically containers. Uh, that If you look at them in, in under the molecule structure, they have the double helix structure of the DNA. The entire human genome has 3,000 alphabets. Uh, it's been called the Book of Life. Uh, we have an average of uh, 25,000 genes. Uh, two unrelated persons share 99.9% .9 of the DNA sequence, so the person si si sitting next to you has a 99% chance of being similar with you. Uh, they have sequenced and understood more than 14,000 single gene disorders, and all you need is just one spelling mistake to cause a genetic disorder. That is how uh, accurate the whole mechanism is in terms of controlling genetic function. The word new genetics was propounded by the editor of the American Journal of Human Genetics sometime in early 1980s when he commented on the novel approaches of mapping the human genome. At the time, there were no such things as sequencer, PCR. They, were only, they only have basic linkage study uh, basic molecular studies, and even then, they knew that the depth of these kind of advances can be achieved. Professor Sir David Wetherall, in his book New Genetics and Clinical Practice, actually accurately predicted how medical practices will change with the new developments, but he lamented that very few genetic diseases can be treated effectively. And it's not far from wrong. At that time, the majority of genetic disease were in, in the pediatric clinic, parents were in search of a unifying diagnosis. So it is not surprising, therefore, the majority of pediatricians are the one probably in the healthcare system, they are most well-versed in genetic disorders. Probably 95% of medical geneticists in the world had their beginnings in pediat pediatric practice. In the coming decades, for example, the issue raised by families will be different in view of the recent developments. And it's again the families who will spearhead all the changes, the revolution in genetic practice. Management of genetic disorders had obviously changed in the past 30 years. We have now the word called omics, right? I'm sure you heard the word omics before. And it has also uh, not spared genetics. So from now, from genetics, it has changed to genomics. And it started way back about 10 years in 1990, where it was announced that Human Genome Project uh, will be done. And on June 26, 2000, it was announced that a working draft of the entire human genome DNA has been completed. Chromosome 22 was the first chromosome to be fully sequenced, which means that they could read it like a book, and truly it's a book of life. On April 14, 2003, the completed human genome sequence was announced. And incidentally, 2003 also represents the 50th year of description of the DNA structure by Watson and Creek. And from this onwards, uh, the, the age of genomics has descended upon us. The question therefore begs to be answered is, what's the difference between genetics and genomics? The main difference lies in the fact that genetics scrutinizes the function and composition of the single gene, whereas genomics addresses all genes and their interrelationship in order to identify their combined influence on the growth and development of the organism. This is a very important difference because, as you can see, genetic counselling 
which has been in the forefront of all medical genetics now, has to adapt itself to the genomics age. But can it really do so? For those working in genetics, the most important criteria, and probably for the clinician, is what we call the genotype and phenotype correlation. Now, this is how it works. If you have a gene and you have a mutation in the gene instructions, you will end up with an abnormal gene product. For example, reduced enzyme activity. This will impact on the function of the organism, leading to structural or functional defects. And in terms of the patient, it will show up as signs and symptoms. And this is where they present themselves to the doctor. And of course, the doctor will then take a good family history, take a uh, medical history, they will examine the patient, and that they will arrive at a provisional diagnosis as how we train all our doctors. And following that, we will do investigations that are relevant to the provisional diagnosis. The analogy to a mutation is very simple. If you have a spelling like this, which codes for certain amino acids like that, if you were to have a change, for example, if you introduce a new alphabet in a sequence, obviously all the downstream byproduct will be changed. Analogies like this, a big cat beat the fat man. If you interest, insert a new alphabet here, you end up with gibberish. And this is a very simplistic kind of explanation why if you have a mutation in the gene, the gene does not function. On the other hand, genomics talk about susceptibility. And what does it mean? Well, we know that, for example, 98% of the human genome does not seem to code for any proteins. Now, these non-coding regions include gene regulatory sequences and this other thing called SNPs, single nucleotide variants of, or polymorphism. SNPs are very important because it has now been uh, found that it's in use to assess a person's susceptibility to disease and even our response to drug treatment. So this is very important. Many adult diseases, for example, cancer, coronary heart disease, diabetes, infertility, psychiatric illnesses are included. And it implied a role for environmental factors. Now we know that, for, that chronic diseases with genetic basis are now a big burden on the physical, social, psychological well-being, not only for the individual patient, but for the family and the country. Will there be someday be a pill? a medicine, a drink, where you can correct all the defects in our RNA and DNA. This is basically the, the situation we, where we are now. The word pathogenesis of genetic disease, genesis itself means in the beginning, right? So in the beginning of the, the genetic disease starts with the gene, and it goes downstream. And every step of this way, ranging from the RNA to the protein, to the structure, to the phenotype, to the family and the community, and every step of the way, there are interventions that we can make to reduce the impact of genetic disease. And this is how it's done. For example, if you have a mutant gene, you have a mutation, we know we can transplant a patient with stem cell transplant, for example, and correct the defect. It's a blunderbuss way of uh, doing it, but it can be done. Of course, the more refined way is to just alter one gene function. But I will speak a little bit on gene therapy. You can also alter or supplement the mutant RNA by modulating the gene expression. You can also uh, replace a protein. For example, if you are diabetic, you may not have enough insulin. You can get insulin injection. Or for those who are hemophiliac, who are short of factor 8, you can replace the factor 8 as an infusion. Or if you have metabolic dysfunction, like many of our metabolic diseases, you can modify disease by restricting the diet. For example, you may not want to give excessive protein load. For the patient with clinical features, for example, congenital heart problem, a cleft lip, a deformed hand, you can have medical or surgical intervention and you can educate the patient. For the family, there's counselling involved. You can screen family members and there's pre-symptomatic testing that can be performed. For community and society, you need to increase public awareness and preventive and health strategies can be undertaken. So the new genetics perhaps has moved on that it is no longer just confined itself to the practice of pediatrics, but it has moved on to all fields of medicine as it is. This is how it's going to be in the next 10 years perhaps. This is what we call personal genomics, moving into the second decade of the 21st century. You may end up with a clinical scenario like this whereby a doctor may face a direct-to-consumer testing result. I had my child tested for certain diseases, XXX disease, using a mouth swab kit. 
and sent to a genetic laboratory overseas, found the company from the internet. Unfortunately, they give me a big rim of results, it shows a very complex disease and many other susceptibility factors. Please tell me what it's all about. So the doctor may actually be confronted by this kind of results that the patient will bring. Second scenario, genetic susceptibility testing. Healthy adults who are perfectly well asking, what are my risks based on family history? What about my genome scan, which I just uh, done for a few thousand ringgit? What options can I take to have a healthy baby? Again, the doctor will be confronted with this kind of situation. Third scenario, what I call as retail genetics. As the word implied, the, 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 the client or the patient may come and see and ask, can you advise me on a proper test or medications or whatever it is for my child's genetic condition? Can I purchase it on the internet or from the website? This is going to happen and indeed it has it is already happening. Not long ago, just about a couple of weeks, even a hair uh, you know, company has also got big news uh, on the events in the Star newspaper, for example, promoting genetic tests for hair loss condition. It helps find effective preventive treatment for hair loss. Right? It reflects a value society where we have thousands of babies dying from genetic diseases and hardly can get publicity. And yet, we have a hair loss company getting front page news. You tell me. Therapeutic possibilities has now emerged, some with disappointment, some overhyped. For example, gene therapy has been oversold. Many scientists have sold this, getting grants, millions of it, but with very little to show for in terms of therapeutic uh, 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 function. For example, promise of gene therapy. They promise to replace the gene with another normal gene using a viral vector or they can skip some axon, or suppress a stop cordon. None of this has been proven to be of great use in clinical uh, work. What have gone wrong? It, basically, there, it was a big rush. All right? For example, there were problems with gene therapy. Number of protein variants outnumbers the number of coding genes. One gene may affect expression of other genes. For example, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where you have a child with dystrophy gene mutation, a mutation will downregulate 327 other genes, and at the same time upregulate 77 other genes. So it's not just so simple as just replacing a single gene as if you would replace a spark plug in your car engine. It is much more than that. You also have to contend with the problem of insertional mutagenesis whereby, for example, there was a successful report of gene therapy for deadly immune deficiency called SCID, but subsequently two out of the nine patients died because of T-cell acute leukemia because the gene that was inserted has switched on another gene called the oncogene, and this has led to leukemia. Another issue, immunological or toxicity effect in an in a individual, a boy who has a urea cycle defect, a metabolic disease, they did gene therapy the patient died because of toxicity issues. And many of these targeted delivery of normal genes failed to reach its target organs. For example, you want the brain and the heart to have the gene inserted, but it never gets there. So it does not work. And therefore, this begs the question is, how personalized is personalized medicine? The failure of gene therapy has highlighted this very important issue that you need to really refocus our genetic research back on basic issues. For example, what's the effect of multiple gene networking effect? What are the correlation between these multiple gene effects with the clinical disease phenotype? Which implies that there's still a role for clinicians to work very hard with the scientists to come up with the answer. And indeed, over the last 10 years, this has resulted in many new findings. For example, epigenetics is a new term, microribonucleic acids and its interference with normal gene function, copy number variations, CNVs. These are all alphabets, as you can see, but they have new meanings. New approaches such as genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, microarray analysis, low-cost sequencing technology. These are all new keywords. Some may even term as a blue ocean strategy, things you should move into as a high-tech biotechnology industry. And this is where personal genomics has arrived. This is an example of how uh, array CGH works, where you know, instead of a simple bench-top uh, laboratory test, machines and robots have replaced the human beings. 
using ch microarray chips, right? Chips and laser technology, you can now detect duplication and deletion of the chromosomes. And all you need is a simple PC, and that's a machine. That's all you have. You just put it on a bench top. You can get a chip that looks like that, and give you results. And how does it work? For example, a patient here who has multiple birth defects. He looks a bit different. He couldn't feed properly. He needs a tube feeding. He got a large toes and a small fourth digit toe. We did all the usual so-called test chromosome study. Didn't come up with anything. But put them with a the microarray, and lo and behold, it come up with a new diagnosis. And indeed, in this patient, there was a loss of a gene, and you can really look at the gene that is missing, and you can identify the syndrome. For example, in this child, he has a rare condition known as rubinstein tabi syndrome. You could not pick it up on just examination or routine tests anymore. So this technology has improved healthcare. But it comes with a price. And the true price is like, could we really afford this test? The other field that has been really propounded as the new wave of genomics is in the field of pharmaceutical development, what we call pharmacogenomics. I give an example of these two genes, CYP2C9 and VKORDC1 gene. Now, this has been implicated in warfarin. Now, as you know, warfarin is an anti coagulant yeah, and also uh, in vitamin K metabolism. And genetic variants of these two genes were associated with bleeding complications if you have prescribed this me medication of warfarin. However, without well-designed large clinical trials, it is uncertain if this genotyping to determine warfarin dosing could reduce adverse effects or improve our health outcomes. The question was never answered, but it has been marketed as the test for all patients to be, who are on warfarin. There are some studies, for example, that validated this for example, in the use of this cyto, uh, uh, toxic drug called methotrexate and this anti-convulsant drug, carbamazepine. But again, the uptake of these tests were limited. Why? Has society rejected this test as being too intrusive? Has that been useful? I personally, this personalized medicine issue falls into two major issues, the gaps, I call it. For most genomic applications, direct evidence about their effectiveness and value of testing are rarely available from randomized clinical trials. For clinicians, this is no strange topic because all drugs, all surgical and therapeutic maneuvers has to be subjected to RCTs. But why should not genomic application? It should be subjected to the same stringent test of evidence-based medicine. Personal genomics applications have been used in symptomatic patients rather than asymptomatic medicine. But this is actually what personalized medicine is about for each individual in society, for those of us sitting here in the, in the, in the hall. It is meant for us, but it can't be used because it's been tested only in symptomatic patients. These are two of the new buzzwords, CV and CU, clinical validity and clinical utility of personal genomics. And the balance of benefits and harm must be evidence-based and it should be subjected to further research and RCT as in practice in all fields of medicine. The second gap is really the heart of medicine, uh, whereby emergent data from recent research has shown that public has been ra rather uh, skeptical about non-specific genomics personalized medicine. It's been rather muted. Why? Because personal genomics deal with loads of data, a lot of risks and probabilities, which cannot be interpreted correctly at this point in time. On the other hand, patients, our families, want an accurate diagnosis for their ailments. They want information on their reproductive risks. They want prognosis. And they want to know what's, happening, what's going to happen to their children. They want sympathy. Not, not sympathy. They want empathy. They want support from the healthcare providers, not cold robot uh, results. The doctor-patient relationship is still vital now make even more important with the emergence of personalized medicine. I will now take a next uh, uh, direction whereby the importance of genetics is still applicable in terms of even uh, for the family, for the doctors, the general practitioners, even for the surgeons. The first stop that we should look at is the use of family tree. The family tree has been used for thousands of years. People love to chart down their family links. And in fact, it's been used for medical practice. It can be used to record medical conditions, family relationships, and you can even identify people at risk of a genetic condition. And in fact, uh, the CDC in the USA has used Family History Public Health Initiative 
as the main screening tool for genetic disorders. It is surprising because CDC never advocated expensive genetic tests. They never advocated personalized genomics. And to many people, they are very surprised and said, what do you need to do? Go back and get a family history. And that is very important because it is a risk factor for many common multifactorial disease. It is underutilized. And most public mem members of the public are aware of this. And many of the current strategies like stop smoking, diet, exercise did not work. And it's now been validated over and over again. Family history is one of the major independent risk factors for most chronic disease or public health significance, and this includes genetic diseases. How does it work? Using a family history tool, for example, you can classify an individual as average risk, which is a standard population risk, a moderate risk, and a high risk. And based on this classification, you can actually stratify an individual whether they should need genetic counselling and personalised intervention, or if you are average risk, then the standard preventive recommendation apply. And this is really how uh, prevention of genetic disease will be happening in the next 10 years or so. I will now take you to the next level, and that is how did paediatrics has moved on to other fields of medicine. And the main thrust of this is the use of genetic counselling. Genetic counselling is not new. It has been around for 50 years or more. It is defined as a communication process that deals with the human problems associated with the occurrence or the risk of occurrence of a genetic disorder in a family. Many people misunderstood it as uh, trying to reduce genetic disease by uh, attempting to induce people to have an abortion, for example. That is not true at all. The aim is not to reduce the incidence of genetic disease in the community. Rather, it is to assist our clients, and we use the word client here because they are not patients. They are just carrying the gene. They are carriers, but they are not patients. So I call clients, our patients and families, to make informed choices and to cope with their difficulties. It is non-directive. We do not tell our clients what to do. They make the choices themselves, and that's the best choice for their family. There are some indications that we use for genetic counselling, and this includes parents who are related to one another, for example, if they are cousin marriage, for example, or they are thinking about doing a prenatal diagnosis, or families with a child who had a severe learning problems or birth defect, Individuals who may want testing because there are certain conditions that occur very frequently in the community. For example, in Caucasian population, they might want to have testing for cystic fibrosis. But cystic fibrosis is very rare in the Asian population. We do see it from time to time. But more importantly, other genetic diseases like thalassemia actually are the main group of disorders that need to be screened. If you have a family history of a genetic disease, you might want to seek genetic counselling. Couples who had infertility problems, who are stillbirths, neonatal deaths. And in the last 10 years, individuals who are thinking of what we call pre-symptomatic or predictive genetic testing, that means doing a genetic test before you get the disease itself. All right? Now, in the last second half of my talk, I would use uh, some examples of research done in University of Malaya, for example, uh, to highlight how this role has changed, how we expanded the role, and some of the implications that can be made uh, from some of this research, research done here. And I'll start with five of these common conditions in Malaysia, birth defects, thalassemia, a syndrome, inborn errors of metabolism, and familial cancer genetics. Now, this is a shocking picture for some who are not familiar, but I do apologize if you feel uh, afraid. This is a child who has neurotube defect. Right. A neurotube defect consists of two major groups of patients. One of them is what we call anencephaly, a child born with severe brain malformation, which, and they are unlikely to, to live for more than a few hours or a few days. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a spina bifida, also called a neurotube defect, and this child may have incontinence as well as lower limb weakness and paralysis, and they may end up with kidney failure due to poor bowel control, uh, bladder control. These two conditions are very severe conditions, but there's a, really a preventive strategy that has been formulated for many years. And this example of two birth defects. Now, from my early years, one of the things that we wanted to study was birth defects. And one of the things that we looked at was an incidence of what we call undistended testis. Now, 
basically this incidence is very unknown in the Asian population. So a few colleagues of mine from the department, Professor Lim and Professor Fatima and I, sat down and we actually, I actually examined a thousand over babies, looking at how many of these male uh, boys had undistended testes and followed them up for one year. And we actually got all the data that we need. It shows that it is a significant uh, problem. Almost 1% of babies of male child continue to have undescended testes. And it's very important to make an early diagnosis because they are associated with some important genetic condition like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And we need to look for the missing testes, for example, because leaving them behind may end up with malignancy at a later age for the boys. Another study that we did was a population-based study on birth defects. Again, when we first started, there was no data at all on birth defects in Malaysia. All we have are hospital-based data. We know that hospital-based data tends to collect very severe types of birth defects, but for the general population, the data are not very useful. So we embark on this with the Ministry of Health, working together uh, in EPO, and we sort of basically got the whole Kinta district to ourselves using an IPRA project. We studied all deliveries uh, from 22 weeks of gestation to one week of life, and we covered 17,000 babies, and the findings were just shocking. The birth prevalence of birth defects in Malaysian population is 1 in 70 or 1.43%, which means that in Malaysia, if you extrapolate this data, 8,500 births are babies are born with major birth defects every year. These numbers are huge. 8,500 infants are born with major birth defects that can be detected during the perinatal period. Clearly, chromosomal disorders were top on the list, 25% while multifactorial accounted for the rest. 2,000 of these babies will die by the first week of life. There's a lot of babies dying every year, every day in Malaysia, but it is not mentioned. What are some of the outcome of this study was, we really need to look at, for example, risk factors like insulin-dependent diabetes in our pregnant ladies, because this is found to be one of the single most important risk factors that can be amenable to treatment because we can treat ladies for diabetes mellitus, control their diabetes, and make sure that they have a healthy outcome. Genetic counselling for families who had inherited condition and investing causes for previous abortion were found to be another important step. All this, you don't need expensive genetic tests. It's taking family history and counselling. And folic acid, as I mentioned earlier, has been one of the main things that can be done. For example, in Malaysia, if you take a population-based study that we did, 0.8 per 1,000 births, 500 babies are born with this terrible disease every year. And fortunately, after consultation for many times with the Ministry of Health, they have issued an advisory to all food manufacturers in the food industry that should be folic acid fortification of flour in Malaysia. However, it is not mandatory. So we still have no clear picture how this effective is this is. But if you were to take the picture of 70% of new tube defects can be reduced just by the mere fort fortification of food with folic acid, you can actually reduce 350 babies born with new tube defects every year. So it's very simple steps that we take, taken. And this is uh, something we can do. I'll move on to thalassemia and I have spent quite a number of years working on this topic. Thalassemia is a blood disorder where there's reduced beta globin gene, uh, gene chain production leading to anemia in the babies. And usually, if you look under the microscope, the cells are very pale, they're very small, and there's a belt, meaning Malaysia is in the belt because thalassemia carriers are uh, uh, protective against malaria. So, but the price to pay for that is that you end up with people with beta, uh, beta, uh, beta thalassemia major a very, very uh, life-threatening conditions. You need regular blood transfusion and iron chelation therapy. What is not well known in Malaysia is that we have two to 300 babies born with beta thalassemia every year. Uh, the registry showed that we have more than 3,000 over uh, individuals with beta thalassemia major. But what is not known in the early 1990s was that at least one third 25 to 30 percent of all the beta thalassemia major in Malaysia came from one state, Sabah. Nobody knew why. And so, 
with some of my colleagues, uh, Professor Chan Lee and a few other people from the Allied Health Sciences at that time, we collected some sam samples from the Kadazan Dusun uh, population. We and this is formed the basis of my uh, doctorate, and uh, we actually went and s studied it. And in those days, in 1990s, late 1990s, there's no sequencer, no PCR that's easy, easily available. So we have to do all this manual work. Uh, probably you haven't heard of it. Uh, we actually uh, extract DNA. We can actually and have to do it by Stoughton blot technology. If you have not heard of that before, very laborious. And over a six months period. I managed to crack the dilemma and the puzzle. We identified the sequence. This entire globin gene in the Kadazan Dusun population has been deleted. It's very different from the Chinese, the Malays, and the Indians. And to, to confirm it, we actually spent a lot of money doing sequencing. At the time, it was very expensive, so we can only do a few sequencing and confirm the part that's missing. And we developed a low cost technology using PCR technique that can detect the missing fragments. Arising from this, this, this to me is one of my uh, pride and joy uh, because uh, from a group of patients who had no prior information, we crack it. And now, following this, many, many other studies have followed and shown that Indonesians all the way to Irian Jaya, to the Southern Pacific Islands, up to Hawaii, this particular deletion is now one of the most common deletion in the beta globin gene. It's a new finding. Uh, we have contact, been contacted by many labs around the world because they have patients from this region and they could not identify mutations, so they wanted to know how we did it. So it is an uh, important finding which I felt that University of Malaya has been one of the contributors to adding new knowledge uh, to this part of the world. Also, because of our work, the government decision for thalassemia screening, and this is of course uh, the previous uh, health minister who actually wanted it to be done, uh, and he actually advocated thalassemia screening. And we actually sat down to develop a national prevention and control program for thalassemia in August 2004. And over a period of several years, we developed a health technology uh, review. And then we pro we, the program consists of four major components. We wanted all children who had thalassemia to be given free drug, iron chelation therapy, because it has to be made affordable. Patients are dying due to iron load, overload, toxicity, because even though they get blood, they are dying from the toxicity of iron from the transfusion. And following that, all our thalassemia patients now are getting uh, this desproxamine. We wanted screening of all carriers. We wanted a health education program, and we wanted a registry. All of it has been done. And one of the things that the genetic community has been asked to do was to set up a thalassemia counseling training program and this is what we have done, uh, working together with a uh, support group for thalassemia, the Ministry of Health, and all the geneticists in the country working together. We trained several hundred counsellors for thalassemia, and they're all working now in various parts of the country. I will move on to the next part, what we call a syndrome. Now, th this field of syndromology or dysmorphology, for some of you probably is a strange word, is, is a very unusual situation, and, and it's not... It's not uncommon. Many, many parents bring their, their children into the clinic and say, something's wrong with my child. He looks a bit odd. People make fun of him. They tease him in the, in the, in the kindergarten. Uh, he's got this, his, this neck, his eyes. He looks different. Can you tell us what's happening? Sometimes they add on new things like, he's not doing well in school. Can you help? So this is the field where we recognize syndromes based on their clinical features. And it is of great interest to the Western scientists and clinicians because they have a lot of database on uh, Caucasian population, for example, on all the various syndromes, but they're very, very little in their database on Asian population. And this is a, a gold mine, if you like, uh, whereby we characterize this mutation. For example, this is a child who's been uh, having uh, severe congenital heart disease, pulmonary stenosis, and we examine him, he's got this very webbed neck, and he's got these typical fa faces, and we diagnose him as having Noonan syndrome. And it's another child who looks similar, he didn't have pulmonary stenosis, but he had another heart disease called ventricular septal defect. My MO thought that he has Noonan syndrome, but I said, have you examined the hands? He said, no, look at the hands, he's got contractures. He's got another different syndrome called Escobar syndrome. The importance of this is this is a dominant inheritance. This is a recessive inheritance. 
We also uh, studied many other syndromes, for example, genomic imprinting syndromes, Prader-Willi syndromes, and Angelman syndrome. This is a child who has never been diagnosed for a long time until he came to our clinic. They couldn't understand why he, he just likes to eat and eat, and he gets very big, and there are concerns that how do we control his diet. Another child who has Angelman syndrome, uh, who couldn't walk properly, but they both have almost identical genetic defects, and this is due to what we call a genomic imprinting error. And over the years, we have worked on many, many syndromes. When I was in Australia as a fellow, we work on many, some of these rare conditions. We look at the gene defects. It's very hard work because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we didn't have a sequencer. It's all step by step. And very important, for example, is the clinical input because without a good clinical input from an astute clinician, you cannot have accurate diagnosis. You have thousands and thousands of patients to work on which patient will give you the highest yield. For example, we work on a, a, a skeletal dysplasia condition called campomelic dysplasia. But this campomelic simply means band bones. But this child did not have a band bone, so we call it a campomelic campomelic dysplasia, which is like a contradiction by itself. But we found it and we showed conclusively that all shared the same mutation called the SOX9 gene mutation. Back home, we also work on many, many other syndromes. And I'm, I'm actually quite happy to have worked with some of you here in the audience. For example, uh, I work with uh, Professor Wong Kam Tong and uh, Mary Ann Tan and a few other people uh, looking at our patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We were the, one of the first few groups to look at all the deletions and the mutations found. And fol following that, we also uh, described the quality of life of our patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which has never been described. We also look at this condition called RAT syndrome, uh, which is also not described before in Malaysia. We also look at the mutation in the MECP2 gene. And also, we also look at new syndromes that had barely been described. For example, in the Bidayu family, this is the second report of a, a syndrome called Al Ghazali syndrome. And this is a very new syndrome we just described. I will show to you one of my most missed opportunities that I had. Uh, which was very interesting, but per perhaps offer a lesson to all budding clinicians. Uh, in the early 1990s, I worked with uh, Dr. Adeline Tan and Prof. Lin. Uh, we have a family, a young family. This is a family uh, taken just a few years ago, but when they first saw me, they were babies. Uh, and this is a saga of genetics. Uh, they last for years and years, and you follow them up, and you get the story after about 20 years. So we first described three family members of eight. With these two concomitant rare disease, distal renal tubular acidosis, and at the time we call it hereditary elliptocytosis, now they rename it and call it Southeast Asian ovalocytosis, in a single family. We postulated it has to be the same gene. But when we submitted to the journals, it was rejected by the reviewers. There's no such thing. Change your title. Change your uh, discussion. So in, and being a young lecturer at the time, we needed publications. We obeyed the reviewers and we put it as, as a separate two different syndromes. But to my eternal regret, of course, uh, a group in uh, uh, Thailand subsequently two years later described this exactly the same syndrome that we described. And in USM, they also found many, many cases which previously never been described. So we were the first group from New Steam Lair to describe this condition, a new syndrome. But because this other group has worked on the genes and we didn't have the facility then, the Americans got to it first. They identified the gene. All right? But nevertheless, we never gave up. We collaborated with the British and they worked on our family and also found similar findings, the SLC4A1 uh, gene. Uh, and in our family, they have a deletion, this one, and the mutation, and it was associated. But we took the story a bit further because while we identified the, the gene that causes that one, the pathogenic mutation, instead of just being a dominant effect, which is what has been propounded by all the scientists, we showed that in our family, it was recessive. Clearly, it was shown that, for example, this family, both parents were normal. They carried the gene. They didn't have any of the side effect. But it manifested itself in all the three children who carried both the compound heterozygote copies. Therefore, implying this is an autosomal recessive inheritance. Same gene, two diseases, two modes of inheritance. Shocking. Right, we'll move on. Inborn errors of metabolism, another one of my field of studies, and I really thank some of those people who I worked with in the past in Australia and in Malaysia. 
Inborn errors of metabolism is basically a genetic condition where there's a, a lack of certain enzyme that's non-functioning, for example. And one of the things that I work on was this, uh, looking at the studies with IMR, collaborating with them. How many inborn errors of metabolism do we have in the Malaysian population? Nobody knows. So we published this first paper that looked at the spectrum of inherited metabolic disease and it may come to a very interesting numbers. One in 3,000 babies had an IEM. It's as common as congenital hypothyroidism. And following that, we actually uh, had recognized many, new, many, many new IEMs, uh, just like in the, in the story of syndrome. For example, uh, Professor Boy referred a family to me. Uh, who has been uh, investigated for biliary atresia. Uh, of course, this uh, baby has been subjected to invasive procedure, biopsy, and so on. But of course, it didn't turn out to be biliary atresia. As you know, biliary atresia is a rare congenital condition uh, where there's prolonged jaundice, and you have to be operated early on to prevent liver failure. But this child did not have biliary atresia. So we work on the inborn errors of metabolism, and sure enough, we identified the first case of citrine deficiency never before described in this part of the world. It has always been described in Japan, Korea, and this is probably the first case report that we had in Malaysia. And following that, three other reports came out in Malaysia describing this same condition. All right. So this is a very important thing. If you find interesting cases, you've got to report it. It may not be significant. But once you report it, you never know how many other cases there will come up. And it's now one of the commonest, I believe, uh, inborn errors of metabolism in this part of the world. Another rare condition that we find, and this is due to astute observation by the doctors in the postnatal ward, a condition called congenital disorder of glycosylation. And we were very lucky because we woke this patient up thoroughly. And this is a baby uh, who was born and a neonate, and the uh, doctors who were examining a postnatal clinic found he's got very unusual lumps and he's got inverted nipples and we further investigate this baby he's got a very small cerebellum with multiple brain anomalies we suspected the child may have a, this condition called CDG and we sent the test and it was very difficult, it was very costly and expensive but we had to do it and we confirmed that indeed this baby suffered for lack of this enzyme called phosphomenomutase so confirming the diagnosis of CDG type 1 and we did the mutation study. We showed two pathogenic mutations, and the story didn't end there. Using the information that we got, we worked it backwards for the family. They managed to do prenatal diagnosis, and it helped them in a way that was previously not uh, possible in the past. And this is where we should embark on our next phase of uh, screening. This is called uh, extended newborn screening. All of you know we screen our babies for G6PD and uh, hypothyroid. But this newborn screening using the latest technology called tandem mass spectrometry is not well known in this country. We are probably the second hospital after arguing with the hospital administrators to get the budget. We are the second uh, hospital in this uh, country to get a tandem mass spec. And I'm confident in the, in the next one year to come, we will launch this extended newborn screening program and uh, with the expertise that we have in this hospital, uh, we have our own homegrown expertise. So we don't really need uh, foreign expertise, but we have to trust our own local people to do it. Okay? It's very important because foreign trained specialists do not know our own Malaysian uh, inborn errors of metabolism. We have people trained overseas coming back, but they have no experience in what we have in this country. So it's very important that we train our young doctors, our own specialists and our sub-specialists in this field. All right? You get a, a foreign expert here, they may not get the, the help you need. Now, I'm going to move on to my last topic uh, here, which is familial cancer genetics. Uh, this is another one of the areas which has been quite interested uh, for many years. <clears throat> now, cancer is a, is a genetic disease. One out of three Malaysians will get cancer in their lifetime. Many people are not aware of that. But among this group of uh, patients with cancer, about 5 to 10% will have familial cancer. Now, this is a, a typical family tree that has seen us in the clinic. This is a lady who came because she's worried. She's 30 years old. Her, her cousin, sister, has breast cancer at the age of 34. She thought, I may not be that far from my cousin. 
So she came to see a general practitioner. And the general practitioner said, Oh, it's fine. Your parents are fine. They don't have breast cancer. You should be okay. You know? But she was much smarter than that. She says, Can't be true. So she went and get a second opinion. And we draw a family tree. And the family tree was quite terrible because her father's uh, sisters, both of them have breast cancer at 45 and 55. One of her cousins has it 34 years of age. And the grandma actually died of breast cancer. And there were some other family history that were not available at the time. And we told her, actually, you know, just because a man, a father, did not have cancer, it does not imply the fact that he will not get breast cancer. He may get prostate cancer. For example, if he carries a familiar cancer gene called the BRCA or BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene. And this starts off with one of my... Uh, uh, collaboration uh, together with a team of experts in this hospital. Uh, there is a, a big group here. Uh, some of you are here in the, in the hall. Uh, and CARIF stands for Cancer Research Initiatives Foundation. Uh, they have been uh, very active uh, on, in the field of cancer research in Malaysia. And they have actually worked with many groups. And, and Unistim Leia is one of the collaborators for them. And uh, this is a group of, uh, of us, uh, and under Prof Yip, Ching Ha, as well as Prof uh, Aisha, together with uh, adjunct professor Tio, uh, she's here in the, in the crowd. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and together with the Ministry of Health uh, people, uh, we have actually embarked on uh, large-scale studies on uh, um, ladies and patients and probably even men with breast cancer. And prior to this, there had been very little information on in, 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 in the Asian population. Now, we therefore work on this and uh, uh, this group that we call ourselves, uh, My Breakfast, you know, you will see about it in, in a short while, we actually did, did a big uh, number of studies, and this is one of the first, first few papers. Uh, we look at the number of uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutations, uh, and as it stands, all genetic testing must have genetic counseling. So we were just part of a team. And this is how one of the papers that came up uh, with my, the genetic counselor that I work with, uh, Ms. Yoon. Uh, and some of the findings were very interesting. For example, hereditary breast ovarian cancer syndrome in Malaysia is not as uncommon as it previously thought. Uh, we studied almost uh, 463 patients out of 1,000 over cohorts uh, in this uh, Mybreca genetic study. 13.5% carry a deleterious mutation, and we provide pre and post counseling. And this uh, counseling and testing were accepted by the majority, but not all, 82% of Malaysian patients at high risk for this syndrome. And we found many interesting findings. For example, risk assessment was limited by large, geographically dispersed, often polygamous and polyandrous family. And very sadly, we do not have a complete cancer registry. This has hampered our work. There were also cultural taboos, for example, about cancers and social marginalization and the lack of contr like regulatory control for genetic discrimination. 78% of our index patients informed their families, not 100%, and 11% of the relatives came forward when offered free counseling and testing. So this comes to my last part of my talk uh, this afternoon, uh, and these are the future. What are the pitfalls, the challenges and opportunities that we face? Genetic testing should always be preceded by genetic counselling, as you have seen very clearly, because it has impact on people who are not patients. They are well people, they may be carriers. As I often tell people, we all are carriers for genetic defects. We are not perfect, we are mutants, in fact. And there are always ethical concerns, for example, people doing genetic studies on children or minors or handicapped who cannot make that decision for themselves. Many genetic tests are often done on a research basis by research assistants who are probably the least trained person in the lab and they are not meant for diagnostic purposes. But some clinicians, because of the need to have some diagnosis, clutch onto these results and use it in their management decisions with, with sometimes uh, terrible outcomes. A negative molecular test does not exclude a diagnosis. This is as opposed to putting a CBC count in the, in, in the machine and you come up with a hemoglobin reading. A molecular testing does not work that way. Conversely, a novel DNA variant or polymorphism may be mistakenly regarded as pathogenic by medical staff not familiar with it because a report that says you have X number of mutations and some people who are not familiar with it question, oh, I found a gene in this one. This is, you have a diagnosis. Nothing can be more further than the truth. 
biotechnology is rapidly evolving. One test that we do today may not be sensitive. Another new test that comes on tomorrow will be able to pick up the diagnosis as I showed earlier on. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this issue of medical genetics in Malaysia. Where are we heading? Because if we do not resolve issues of stigmatization and discrimination, this, this problem will become bigger and bigger in this country because there's no stopping people from uh, making fun of you because of your genetic uh, background or, at the worst case scenario, discriminate you in terms of your employment, of your lifestyle. There's also lack of equitable access to genetic services in this country. The rich and the affluent will always get what they need. But what happens to the poor and the underserved community? Where are these people going to get the help? Insurance will always ask you questions like, do you have a genetic test? Do you have genetic conditions? i give you an example. If you work in pediatrics, if you were born, if your child is born with a major birth defect, if you bought insurance, the first thing they will say in, in the insurance form, do you have a child with birth defect, congenital malformation? If you tick, put a tick there, I'm sorry, you will not get insurance coverage. This is pure discrimination on the part of a business. What about the ethical, legal, social and religious issue? Religion is a part of life, a way of life for many people in this country. We have to take into cognizance their needs, but yet we need to come into terms their healthcare needs as well. We need to find a middle ground. The field of medical genetics is changing. It is changing the boundaries, it is changing the way that we practice medicine. There is increasing number of medical geneticists being trained, but we still do not have adequate genetic counsellors or geneticists. We need to set up more support group because patients are in the forefront of advocating for their rights. We have set up Malaysian Rare Disorder Society, Datu Hadija, the president, she's here today, as well as other societies like Malaysian Metabolic Society. We also have set up professional bodies like Medical Genetic Society of Malaysia to represent the needs of the professionals. And very important, we gain government recognition of clinical genetics as a separate specialty in the National Specialist Register with its training program. And because of that, many of us are now invited to sit in international bodies to give conferences overseas, to give our viewpoints. And I'm particularly proud to say that you know, WHO has recognised our work and we in UN, for example, have been asked to give our viewpoints and this is one of the publications by WHO, a monograph which is used worldwide, Management of Birth Defects and Hemoglobin Disorders. And uh, this is one of the important milestones that we can be proud of. We are also a founding member of the Asia-Pacific Society of Human Genetics in recognition of Malaysia's contribution to all the work done in genetics. On a personal note, this is one of my favourite. I managed to spend some time in CDC. Uh, many people are surprised that CDC is for infectious disease. I said no. CDC have many, many divisions, as you can see here. Uh, that was in 2003. They have all the security measures after 9-11. So you get to get scanned and everything is on a database now. It is called the NCBDD, the, Nas the National Center for Birth Defects Developmental Disabilities. It is the American Center for Looking at Genetic Disorders and People with Disabilities. And of course, uh, you, if, you, if you want further details, you can find it in, in this book that we wrote together with a few other Fulbright scholars. We call it Fulbright Chronicles. Uh, published by the University of Malaya, uh, American Experience, Malaysian Perspective. All right? And one of my highlights is spending time at the Capitol Hill. Uh, of course, I didn't get to meet the president. But what I'd like to spend a few minutes is the real heroes of this story, the unsung heroes, because these are the people who make this story possible. This is my patient, uh, Pao Yi. Pao Yi was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. He's been bedridden. He, he comes in a wheelchair. He couldn't go to school. She couldn't write, all right? And uh, she's a bright, bright young child at the time. So one of the things that we did was, could she have a metabolic disease? And my answer is possible because there are new diseases to be described called neurotransmitter disorders. And sure enough, we did some tests on her, confirmed the diagnosis, prescribed the correct medication, and before you know it, she's up and about from a wheelchair She's now you know, able to write. You can see as evidence she could write the handwriting. Not that good, 
And she could use the dictionary because I was asking, why do you use this word rejuvenate? Because she speaks in Mandarin. So she searched up the dictionary in Mandarin and came out with the word rejuvenate. I said, may not be the best choice of word, but probably describe how she feels. All right? And she is very proud. On her birthday, they took her out for dinner. Uh, she was staying in the home because the parents couldn't look after her. But now she could walk, she could get about and took her out for dinner. And she was so happy as she sent me a photograph and a, and a card. There are many, many such stories of heroism. These are true heroes because they face life with a quiet uh, dignity, a grace. Uh, for example, I have a patient here who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but very unfortunate for him, and some of you know him. He has uh, acute leukemia, but he was a fighter. He fought all the way. He achieved remission. And one of the things that he wanted to see was he's a big fan of Man U, Manchester United team. So we actually got him in a wheelchair, put on the favourite red colour T-shirt, and met all the, the great footballers, and he got one of his wishes achieved. Sometimes we don't have uh, happy stories to tell you. Some of my patients died very young, and they were robbed of a very bright future. And sometimes we, we suffer together. They taught us many lessons as our doctors. Uh, we are very humble. Sometimes even in funerals, we, they ask us to give some eulogy, and this is one of my patients here who has mucopolysaccharidosis. Uh, he died fighting his disease, but um, his parents were very proud of him. <clears throat> one of the things that I did as an angry young lecturer, uh, having to deal with children with Down syndrome, as some of you would know who are senior enough, children with Down syndrome and congenital heart disease, just about 20 years ago, they never get any cardiac operation. They are left to die. Parents get very upset with us, and I was one of the junior doctors then, very upset too, because they should not be allowed to die needlessly like that. So I, I sort of kept that in my mind. And then 10 years later, I met another, another family with Down syndrome. This time, we have much improved. We have all the resources. This little baby has acute leukemia, uh, but he relapsed on, uh, on treatment. So we put him on a very terrible regime of cytotoxics, Prognosis still very poor. And just about one week before his birthday, the, the, the mother came up quietly. And for those who are not familiar, I actually worked in the oncology ward for a few years. Uh, and mom came up to me and says, can I uh, pull out his long line? Because I don't think I want him to get his chemo today. I said, why? You know, he's, he's still got 5 to 10% chance. The mom says, well, you know, you might get 5 to 10% chance of him leaving, but he's got 90% of not leaving and suffering. For the rest of his one week, whatever life he has, I want him to have a happy life with his family. Doctor, please take him out of the ward. So we did. We stopped his chemo, pulled out his long line, sent him home, celebrated his first birthday at home with all his friends and uh, family in the kampong, and he died a few days later. All right. So these two families, two children with Down syndrome, memorable patients. I wrote this letter to the BMJ thinking that they would never publish it, but indeed they did, because it was so memorable to them, because I said, they're down, but they're not out. And following that, we have now recorded many of these stories, because I felt that their stories needed to be told. So working with the MRDS, Dato Hatija and her team, and I'm very fortunate to have here today Ms. Uh, N.F. Chin, uh, my co-author for this book. We, uh, uh, Ms. Chin called it Rare Journeys of Love. Uh, we have many, many different titles, but basically uh, it is a, a story about those with rare disorders. Uh, and we launched this book, and this is Datuk Hatija and Datuk Ghazali, and this is uh, Miss Chin here with the book. And this is our patient with Prada Willy. And you may be surprised to know that he actually drew this cover. He's an artist. So uh, someone with Prada Willy syndrome, he drew this, and he actually made a living out of, art, of his art. And we actually, I think Ms. Chin bought his art and make it part of the cover of our, our first book together. So it is, is of a great pride and joy for all of us. So ladies and gentlemen, I have taken you on a long journey. But in, in, in a nutshell, we need to use curative and preventive uh, uh, approach to reduce the impact of genetic disease. Genetic counselling should be the mainstay of all genetic services you just can't take a patient's, take his blood, take his tissue, and do personal genomics. There's no such thing. We need to do more clinical research into genetic conditions that are particularly in Malaysia. 
while we can get all the technology and expertise from Europe, Ireland, or whatever, we still have our own in-house knowledge gleaned from our own patients. There's nothing greater than learning from our patients. Personal genomics should be subjected to clinical trials. It should not be direct to consumer testing. And very last but not least, empowering our families and individuals should be a priority. I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, some of these people I have already listed in the booklet that you have in my hand, but in particular, I'd like to thank uh, members and staff of the uh, Department of Pediatrics. I've worked there for almost 20 years now. Uh, it's always a great joy. Uh, meet many new people all the time, new MOs, new specialists. Uh, and sometimes we have farewells and makans. And of course, this is our new building. Uh, and this is our Bacha'an Yasin we had just had. And so we had a group photograph. So uh, it's a, a milestone. But also very important, uh, the support people behind the scene. All right? Many people don't give enough uh, due recognition for the clerks, you know, the office boy, the dispatch person. They are also as part of our family working together. And this is during their raya. I was very glad that they invited me to join in their little function. Um, last but not least, a uh, very important part of my life, my family. Um, I'm, <coughs> I'm very sad actually my, my father, he passed away many years, a few years ago. He's not here today, but I'm sure he'll be uh, very happy to see me speaking here today. And these are two of my kids uh, when they were younger. So I'll end up with a little uh, thing I wrote this, this morning. Uh, I thought I should do something like this. Uh, I call it Jiwa Dan Raga. Um, I'm sorry for those who couldn't understand Malay, but uh, I'll read it out in Bahasa. Yeah? So, dari sekolah rendah, jalan 10 ke Universiti Malaya, mengenang semula peristiwa manis pahit di jiwa dan raga, kisah benah penyakit genetik, perubatan dan masyarakat di negara, Di pohon maaf sekira ada silap dan salah di syarahan perdana. Thank you very much. Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan yang dihormati, kini majlis mempersilakan Profesor Datuk Rohana untuk membuat rumusan mengenai syarahan perdana yang telah disampaikan oleh Profesor Dr. Tong sebentar tadi. Dipersilakan. Ladies and gentlemen, I think Professor Tong have taken us from Watson and Crick, yeah, the genetic and genomic, personal genome, personalized medicine, all through the beautiful work of a molecular genetist. Uh, and I think that uh, I have not much to say, but I think for Pao Yi and other patients, you are their hero, Professor Tong. Okay. Dengan ini saya akhiri dengan wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Majlis mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Profesor Datuk Rohana kerana sudi mempengerusikan syarahan perdana pada petang ini. Terima kasih juga kepada Datuk-Datuk, Daten-Daten, Barisan Pengurusan Fakulti Perubatan, Warga Universiti Melaya, serta para hadirin kerana telah sudi meluangkan masa pada petang ini. Dengan itu, berakhirlah sudah syarahan perdana oleh Prof. Dr. Tong Miao Kiong. Saya bagi pihak majlis memohon ampun dan maaf Sekiranya terdapat sebarang kesilapan dan kekurangan semasa atau dalam perjalanan majlis. Majlis dengan ini berbesar hati menjemput semua hadirin untuk menikmati jamuan yang, yang diadakan di luar dewan ini. Saya sudahi dengan wabillahi taufik wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sekian, terima kasih.